Did it start already? Yeah. Okay. Our attendees are coming in. So we are going to just wait for like one minute um, and then we can start. So participants do keep coming in. Um... Okay, I think we can start now. Um, so, um, Caroline, can you start pinning, right? Pinning. You yeah, pinned. <laughs> Pin. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, so let me start with a bit of webinar ritual. Um, to say thank you for you all to join us and good afternoon from Bangkok, uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, and welcome you all to the Our Mekong, Our Say webinar series. And this web webinar, we give it a title, Must the Environment Be Sacrificed for Infrastructure Development? And um, my name is Palita. I am a Mekong Program Officer um, for the Internews Earth Journalism Network, or we call our organization shortly EJN, and I'm also an editor for Mekong I, and I will be a moderator today. Um, so before we meet our speaker, let me give you a brief background of this webinar. Um, so um, the event today is part of the EJN project called Our Mekong Our Say, and throughout this project, we focus on building journalist capacity to report on national resource governance in the Mekong region. And we also want to increase public access to information um, relating to the resource issues. And our project is funded by the USAID Mekong for the Future um, through the WWF. And um, before I forget, um, I want to announce that we have Thai and Khmer simultaneous interpretations so you can switch to Thai or Khmer channel by clicking on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. And, and any one of you who want to listen in English can just stay at the original audio channel where we are now. Um, okay, uh, let me get back to the webinar. So, um, so just a bit of introduction. So today we're going to learn more about case studies uh, of the impact of infrastructure development from our speakers uh, and understand more about how they investigate these impacts from a journalistic and expert's point of view. Um, we will also discuss the solution on how to make the infrastructure development sustainable and holistic. And I want to emphasize that this webinar is not against infrastructure development. We are trying to look for the ways to make the development benefit the people and at the same time, maintain the good health of environment. And we're gonna have three speakers with us today to discuss this matter. And I want to 
um, let you see them first. Um, so maybe Ryan, can you start introduce yourself? You are muted, sorry. I am Ryan McNeil. Uh, I am uh, the Deputy uh, Data Journalism Editor for Reuters. Uh, I'm based in London. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, our series called The Batlands. And Dennis? My name is Dennis Smirnov. Uh, I used to work for conservation NGOs, protecting forests in Asia mostly. And so last eight years, I'm mostly focusing on investigation of business activities uh, contributed, which contributes to deforestation and forest degradation in Asian countries. And Uwana, please. Thank you, Paruta. It's such a pleasure to be a part of this panel. I am Urvana Menon, and uh, I look at uh, Mekong for Future's work on linear infrastructure. Mekong for Future is a multi-country program across Greater Mekong. Uh, supported and funded by the USAID. And uh, in my attempt of working around linear infrastructure, we work with stakeholders, partners to really see the opportunity that lies of transforming infrastructure in a way that works for nature, people, and economies. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, the three of you. Um, so the way we're going to facilitate, facilitate this webinar today, um, we're going to ask each speaker to go through the presentations for around 12 to 15 minutes, and then we're gonna have Q&A section at the end of the webinar. Um, but if any of you want to ask questions first, uh, you can drop your question at Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen, and then I will collect your questions and ask speakers um, for live answer. Okay, I think that's all for my side. Um, well, let's begin um, with Ryan. Um, so Ryan, you and your team at Lighter have done a really impressive uh, investigative data stories called the Badlands that you mentioned already. And when we saw this page, we were like, we have to get you here. Um, so it will be interesting to hear from you more about how you um, did this investigation, how it took off, uh, the process behind. So Ryan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me and um, thanks for your kind words about our work. It was um, nearly three years in the making. Um, we started during the height of the pandemic um, and we published um, five what we call special reports at Reuters, which are uh, very long pieces uh, from uh, various places around the world. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and I apologize. I'm a little dark. We've got, it's, as it happens, tends to be a very uh, rainy day here in London. So um, it's a little dark today. So I'm gonna share my screen so you can follow along. Um, so uh, we called our series, The Batlands, and I'm gonna skip through the who am I part um, since we already did that. Um, most of the viruses um, that afflict humans um, are circulating in wildlife. And um, when they infect humans, um, this is an, a, an event known as uh, zoonotic spillover. Um, and some of the deadliest of those of, of diseases have been over the last half century have been linked to bats, like Ebola and Marburg and Nipah. Um, and they happen more frequently than people think. Uh, and any one of them has what the World Health Organization has called um, epidemic potential. We don't know yet how people were, how, you know, we don't know the origin story of, of COVID-19 yet. Um, but we know it's related to a family of coronaviruses found in certain kinds of bats common in Asia that launched a pandemic in 2003, the first SARS. Um, and like I said, during the height of the pandemic, Deb had been, uh, she had been researching um, sort of the growing body of evidence that zoonotic spillovers uh, are linked to land use change and deforestation and other kinds of, of human driven activities. And, um, you know, she mentioned that she, she mentioned this to me, 
Um, and we started reading the academic literature and we thought we might be able to sort of come up with a way to predict areas that are highest risk for these types of uh, spillovers. And we turned to the, the original problem was we needed to identify sort of where, um, you know, past spillovers, um, where they had occurred. Um, and we, we ended up finding uh, this group at Jinko, which was previously Meadow Biota. And they helped us sort of identify uh, a universe of zoonotic spillovers. Um, and what we did then was we also assembled a, um, so we built a data set of covariates about ecological conditions in each area. And by each area, I'm talking about uh, 25 square kilometers. Uh, and so we used a variety of different um, covariates, everything from elevation to bat species richness to tree loss during the current year, tree loss in the past years, tree loss in surrounding areas, um, land cover, a variety of different uh, variables. And so what we essentially did was we used a, a, a machine learning model, random forest to be exact. And we essentially said, okay, given the environmental conditions around these past spillovers, can you then tell us using those same ecological variables, where else in the world do similar conditions exist? And without going too deep into detail, we had to come up with sort of a way to differentiate the results. Um, and you can see here, this is basically, uh, each one of these is an area uh, going back for each year from 2002 to 2020. And so what we did was we, we sort of concentrated on the areas that fell within this zone, which was the 95th percentile. And we called those jump zones. And that allowed us then to begin to zero in on um, specific places around the world that had where human activity had uh, turned, um, had elevated risk or expanded risk um, in various countries. We found these jump zones at 113 different countries on every continent except uh, Antarctica. One of those places that we uh, zeroed in on was Laos. Um, Laos, we found, had lost 19% of its tree cover from 2000 through 2020, driven by a massive growth in rubber plantations and other agriculture and mining. And this was really telling, these are jump zones in 2003 on one side, and then the jump zones by 2020. And so these jump zones had increased to nearly 73% of Laos. Um, and I know that we have a Southeast Asia audience. So here's more of a regional look, 2002 and 2020. And you can see how these, uh, how these areas have changed. But we needed to understand a little more about Laos. Like we had this you know, predictive analysis, but we wanted to know what was happening on the ground. And so you know, Laos has not historically been uh, a, an open country. So we had to do a lot of other research, academic papers and books and state media and government documents and securities filings and a variety of different things to try and assemble an understanding of the history of these areas and uh, what was happening uh, on the ground. Now let's talk about real risk, uh, viral risk. Um, in 2017, scientists published a paper uh, detailing the discovery of coronaviruses in bats for sale at markets across Laos. And the paper's data showed us sort of the widespread nature of the risk of bat consumption in markets across Laos. Um, and then additionally, last year, a Pasteur Institute scientists detailed the discovery of basically they identified the closest known link or the closest known coronavirus to SARS-CoV-2. And it was found in an area of Laos called uh, Phuong. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But as you can see, you know, there are, you know, scientists have found actual 
uh, viral risk in this area. So this isn't just, um, you know, our model predicting something. It's also backed by um, a body of scientific literature. So we concentrated on three areas, Long Nam Tha, uh, which is uh, where Chinese backed little rubber plantations have driven a tremendous expansion, a tremendous disruption of bat habitat. Um, and we detailed how it was the result of, of official Chinese government policy. Um, and, you know, to understand that we turn to, in, in, in my um, uh, uh, presentation, you'll see some of the resources that we turn to, to try to understand, um, you know, how uh, China influenced the expansion of rubber plantations across Wang Nam Tha. Um, and now also uh, amid this altered landscape, is um, a town, a place called Boten, which is a special economic zone uh, controlled by Chinese interest as well. Um, and, you know, it is this really, it's, you know, if you look at the satellite imagery of Boten, I mean, it's these magnificent, you know, these tall buildings just kind of jutting up into the forest. Um, and let me see if I can give you, like you can see here, there's a, there's a train station and the way that it sits in this valley of these lush mountains. And, you know, you can even see rubber plantations in here. And, and this is, um, you know, the, the Boten is also the sort of the railhead of the Laos side of a rail, a high-speed railroad that now connects Kunming, the capital of Yunnan province to uh, Vientiane, the capital of Laos. And, we rode that high-speed rail line, um, and we stopped in Boten. We stopped in Vang Ving, which is a popular uh, spot for Western backpackers and other tourists. You know that has these spectacular karsts and and um, caves. And I just thought the the photography that we got from this area was absolutely stunning. Um, and you know the karst is is critical bat habitat, and it's also this thing that draws tourists to Veng Ving is also uh, a source of, it's a source of, uh, you know, natural resources, limestone that is used to build the railway and to build highways and uh, to help um, uh, infrastructure development in Laos. Um, you know, we learned about, um, you know, the, the history of cement plants that are in Vang Ving. Uh, we did that by reading um, securities filings. Uh, one of the cement companies was the first publicly traded company in Laos. And um, through the documents that they filed with the government, we were able to understand where they got their uh, resources from and the history of, of uh, cement production in that region. We also turned to various other piece, pieces of data and I don't wanna go too long, so I'll skip over some of it. Um, and we also visited the Vang Ving market. We, what we were doing was we were trying to link what was happening on the ground to what our model was showing. And this same place where scientists had documented coronaviruses and bats for sale in a market in Vang Ving, um, uh, we found them still for bats still for sale at the markets. Um, and so these are risk factors, scientists say. And, and, um, we also, and when you uh, leave Vang Ving, there's a parallel um, new highway that's been constructed. And you can see here where it's been blasted through karst. Um, and you can see uh, quarrying on the side. Um, and so if you take that about an hour and a half south, um, I'm sorry, if you go a little bit farther south and then you go directly west about an hour and a half, you'll get to this place we talked about earlier called Fuang District. And Fuang District is, um, and we visited some of these same caves where uh, bat guano harvesting is occurring um, in the very same caves where scientists have, like I said, discovered these uh, uh, coronaviruses in bats that are closely, very closely linked, uh, uh, very close genetic relatives of SARS-CoV-2. And we watched them work and, and, and we blended that with an understanding that the government hopes to turn this once very remote area into a tourist destination. Um, and so, you know, what we were trying to show is that, you know, that, that um, you know, with this development, um, you know, there are risks uh, inherent in that development. And that sort of leads into, um, and I hope I'm not going long, I'm trying to finish here quickly, um, the, uh, the solution side of it. You know, we're, as 
um, we said at the beginning, this is not a panel about that infrastructure development is bad. But I think one of the, what Laos represents is sort of a lack of understanding about the risks involved. And, um, you know, we're still not aware where any, you know, about this, where any steps at all taken to mitigate, um, you know, these types of risks, I'm guessing not. Um, and so we have a whole piece on, uh, that we call the solutions piece and, um, you know, Scientists say development doesn't have to stop. Um, you know, it's about understanding those risks that are that are uh, in these areas and um, trying to mitigate them. You know, we do environmental impact assessments. Um, you know, scientists say we should include, um, you know, biological impact. I suppose would be a a, a way of of uh, uh, describing it. Um, and we need to understand, you know, these ecosystems and, and bat behavior, you know, despite bats making up such a huge part of uh, the number of mammal species on Earth, we still know very little about their behavior and, and um, the way they act. And, and scientists say we need to understand more about that. Um, and in the end, um, you know, prevention is, prevention is cheaper than response. We, we've learned that, I suppose, with, with warfare. We have... Um, we try to prevent costly, costly battles. And, and as we all know in this room, COVID-19 was enormously expensive. Um, and so right now, members of the World Health Organization, just to tie this up, members of the World Health Organization right now are discussing a pandemic treaty. And so far, most of the discussion has been uh, around sort of what to do after um, the, the disease emerges. Uh, they'll soon be talking about whether to include preventative uh, measures such as uh, One Health. And, and so the question, the big question that I'll leave you with is, you know, which direction are they going to go with this? Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll sum up. And um, if you have questions, um, you can contact me here and I'll also uh, work to make this uh, presentation, uh, write a link. So if you don't have time to write it down, um, you can find it through that link. But um, anyway, uh, thanks for listening. And um, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, well, actually, there's a lot of information in the Lloyder story. I encourage you to look at the link I just share in the chat box. Um, you will find a lot of information there. Um, okay, then um, let's turn to Dennis for now. So um, Dennis, um, I, I'm, I'm aware that you conduct a, an investigation on how illegal logging is covered up by the infrastructure projects. Um, and I think you told me that this practice has continued even until today and not many reports um, appear in the media on this matter. And, and for everyone, the audience here, then this investigation has not been published anywhere before, I believe. Um, so yeah, let's hear from Dennis uh, what he's fighting. So Dennis, go ahead. Thanks, thank you, Parita. So I, I, I'm going to share the, my, my presentation just to illustrate or to show some, some results of our investigation in Laos. Even I will be based on results of investigation in Laos, the same thing. So I observed and investigated in different countries of Mekong region, for instance, in Cambodia or in Myanmar. So in Thailand, to some extent, as, as, as well. So I believe the results are still relevant, even this it's quite old story. So let me share the, uh, my screen. OK, that's fine. So even uh, so, the roads are known to open access to new forest areas. So and um, and the new road, road construction used to trigger, I would say, chain reaction. So at the beginning, uh, the forest adjacent to the roads are allocated as a timber, uh, plant, uh, as a, the timber con concessions, and also illegal logging starts. Uh, with selective uh, logging of most valuable uh, large trees. So on the next stage, following the roads, along the roads, the farmers enter the area to clear small and mid-sized uh, fields 
And simultaneously, the gangs of illegal loggers also scoop out remaining valuable trees. And the uh, final third stage, the rights of the encroachers of the farmers are legitimized. So usually it happens on the eve of elections on big events when the government is interested in, the, in their votes. And the remaining degraded forests are transferred to uh, concessions for industrial agriculture with the clearance of all remaining trees. That's the worst case, worst case scenario. In the countries with a high level of corruption, poor law enforcement, and some lack of oversight, independent oversight from the public society, such worst case scenario is hard to avoid. Uh, in famous example of such scheme is a sad story of the Snow Wildlife Sanctuary, sanctuary in uh, Eastern Cambodia. I believe our Khmer participants are very well familiar with this case. So after the road construction, the forest in wildlife sanctuary disappeared within the decades and the uh, sanctuary was uh, degazetted finally in 2018. Even sometimes it's possible to avoid complete deforestation, but even in that case, construction of new road or upgrading existing road in 100% case, cases in these countries leads to forest degradation since all large trees are extracted either by semi-legal companies or by small, uh, the numerous teams of um, illegal loggers. In parallel with the uh, process of forest degradation, there are also cleansing of forests adjacent to roads from wildlife since uh, with appearance of roads, local hunters can sell their prey to the external markets. In addition, outsiders, for instance, the construction companies, workers are also engaged in the hunting. So finally, degraded forests turn to empty forest. Uh, actually, uh, to harvest, harvesting and uh, transporting tens of thousands of undocumented timber require a high number of heavy equipment inside of the forest areas. We, as a part of the WWF Carbon and Biodiversity Project in Laos, we tried to assess the scope and uh, analyze the mechanism of illegal logging. Uh, first of all, we found that uh, Lao experts, the volume of Lao wood experts, as reported by importing countries by Vietnam and China to some extent, exceeded the officially allocated logging quotas in Laos many folds. And if we would compare the Lao experts, as reported by China and Vietnam, with uh, volume of timber actually harvested, recorded by, by the government, this discrepancy was even more dramatic. Uh, then actually we zoomed in on some potential sources of illegal wood in, in Laos. Forest Ridge, southern provinces of Laos, Atapu, Saraman, uh, Cham Champasak, and the second. And there was the same discrepancy. Export of wood from these provinces was uh, much bigger. Sometimes it was uh, two times bigger than uh, logging quotas allocated by lo lo local authorities. How it can happen? So, as I mentioned, actually the transporting and harvest, harvesting and transporting of 10,000 of the undocumented would require quite high number of heavy equipment inside of the forest area. So it's not surprising that our prime suspects, the companies which had an uh, official right to operate in the forest, usually it was a holder of concession for construction of the roads, uh, hydropower dams, uh, transmission lines, mining, which also had a, a logging quota to cut down the trees 
in ports of the clearance of areas for transmission lines, the roads, reservoirs, etc. Uh, actually, we investigated uh, this mechanism, an example of 70 different infrastructure projects in these four provinces in the South and Laos. It's in it included also construction of road, 101 kilometers road in the Sikon province. The local authorities claimed that uh, according to requirements uh, of the forest law, the team of the forests before the construction started, the team of the foresters were sent to the forest to conduct the survey along the entire 101 kilometer routes of the of the new of the planet's road. So to uh, count, measure, and mark all large trees within the 25 meters zone from the center on the both sides of the road. Uh, the results of this prevailing survey were included in the logging quota. So it's, uh, they counted 10,000 trees with, uh, with a volume of 19,000 cu cubic meters. So this volume of some certain species of so some certain grades, quality, quality were included in the logging quota, the permission for har harvesting. From very beginning of our investigations, uh, the credibility of this prevailing survey was questionable for us. First of all, it was very doubtful for us that this small team of the six foresters can do this survey, measure 10,000 trees during less than two weeks. In, other, in our in other pilot study, the area of the same, same size were surveyed by a team of 18 foresters during 21 days. And it was also not a perfect survey, but much more credible. So we decided to investigate it. We collected uh, different kind of the relevant official documents. We also conducted the field survey on the ground, uh, logging, check logging sites, log depots. We also mapped the log logging based on interpretation of high resolution satellite images before and during the logging. We even ordered the special shooting by Korean uh, CompSat freeze satellites to take up to date, most up to date, the image of our target site. It was not easy task, even uh, the usually high cloudness in, in, in this area. Anyway, we got these uh, uh, images and based on it, we conducted the mapping. So as a result of our field survey and also interpretation of high resolution satellite images, we found that uh, actual uh, construction of road is going on far from the uh, project design. But uh, most interesting from our perspective was that actually the old logging was found in the area beyond the zone of uh, allocated road, road construction. In one point, of the logging was 40 kilometers away from the closest point of the road. So actually, the, our research has shown that uh, actually the logging came in the form of extraction of best quality trees of target species with the highest volume. So it also included the species which are prohibited for logging by law regulations, including the rosewood. Of course, the volume, species, composition, and grades of actually harvested timber drastically differed from what was permitted under the quote, and of course, what was in uh, this fictitious prevailing uh, survey. We found there was a lack of state control. The forest inspection and other law enforcement agencies did, didn't inspect the logging sites and the log depots and the further turnovers of, of, the, uh, of the timber, uh, transportation, uh, processing, and, and the export. Actually, why it happens, so how it can be possible. Actually, 
interviewing the forest inspector and local inspectors and the local authorities, we found that they consider, they believe issuing the logging quarter gives the green light to contractor to harvest uh, desired woods, regardless of uh, loc location, any borders, without any time frames and special special limits. So these favorable treatments of uh, contractor cannot be, uh, actually it's hard to understand it without uh, involving the corruption relations be between the contractors and, and, and authorities. Um, actually, finding of this case study is the same as um, results of our in our observation of other 16 infrastructure uh, pro projects demonstrated and allowed us to suggest that all these uh, logging quotas for clearance of roads, uh, transmission lines, hydropower dams, actually it, it just uh, became a way to legitimate large scale, high grading, selective logging in any types of the forest in Laos. Approximately one year after we disseminated the findings of our study and uh, Lao authorities became aware of our findings. The Lao government actually took very bold steps uh, to strengthen the enforcement of forest laws, including uh, enforcing the ban on the uh, exports of log and sawn woods. These measures uh, led to dramatic reduction of export of uh, logs and uh, sawn woods, actually, so it's export in the past it consisted mainly of illegal wood to Vietnam and China. Uh, I would love, I, I would actually like to stop this happy ending. Unfortunately, there is a, uh, evidence to believe that this old practice of illegal logging under the cover of uh, infrastructure projects are returning to Laos. Uh, infor local information from the local sources information came about the large scale transportation of logs in the southern Laos from Laos to, to, to Vietnam again. So therefore we need really closely monitor the all infrastructure projects which can cover illegal logging and uh, open opportunities for interested parties to do it again. So I will just mention the few projects, which just the top five infrastructure projects in Laos, which attracted my attention during the last year. So one of these projects is, is, a, is a plan of the Lao government to build the road from and paved road from, from the Lao Myanmar friendship bridge to China border. So another plan is also Laos and China have been conducting feasibility study of expressway from Kuai Sai on the Thai border to both end on the China border. So it's this project estimated to cost around 4 billion US dollars. Another project is, is it's again, it's pop up. So it surfaced again as a project of railroad construction from Vientiane to Vung Kang seaport in Vietnam. So it, it will be 555 kilometers with approximate cost around five, five billion US dollars. Uh, last um, April, in April 2023, the work on, on the so-called Moonson uh, wind farm project started in Sikong and Atapui province of, of Laos. So it's believed to be the largest wind farm in Southeast Asia with a capacity around 600 mega megawatts. The construction includes transportation and installation of 133 uh, wind turbines and laying and upgrading around 200, 200 kilometers of access roads. And the last one in June this year, uh, the authorities of Quang Chi province of Vietnam suggested construction 160 kilometers of conveyor belts 
to transport coal from Sekong and Saravan provinces to Mitu ports in, in Vietnam. So the, the question whether if this new project will cause new search of illegal logging in Laos. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Um, I think we have to move on quickly to Uana, um, and we get back to you again, Dennis, at the end of this webinar. So um, we have heard two case studies from Ryan and Dennis um, concerning of the challenges in infrastructure development. So Uana, I, I think you're gonna zoom out and show us how we can address this, right? And rethink infrastructure development in a more sustainable way. So Uana, it's your turn. Hi, can you can you hear me okay? Okay, so thank you so much. Actually, these are really difficult and big shoes to fill in after Ryan and Dennis because they've done such thorough, detailed investigative work. Um, and what I'm going to do, like Parita said, would be just say that would would be probably like a little bit of a tutorial into what happens when infrastructure is planned and what is the opportunity, like I said. So because of paucity of time, I would just quickly go on to go on with my presentation. But otherwise, you can just quickly scan this link and watch a video later. So this is a video. You can keep the link safe and uh, you can watch it after the presentation and then it will make a lot of sense. OK, so what I'm going to talk about really is optimizing uh, investment decisions. What do I mean by optimizing investment decisions? A lot of planning and money and resources and public mandate and private interest goes into developing infrastructure. But can we really ensure that this infrastructure works for people today, tomorrow, for generations to come, works for our economy, but also works for nature? Right. And uh, I'm, let me know if the slide doesn't change. But um, so basically, what's the paradigm? We have basically set it up. We've set it up for a ninety five trillion dollar investment in infrastructure happening within the next seven years. Right. This is an OECD figure. And a lot of this is coming from, say, the recession we saw because of COVID, from the slums that the economies saw in their growth rates. And, and you know, infrastructure was looked at this magic wand that's going to help recover economies. So 75% of the built infrastructure that we will see in the year 2050 does not even exist today. So, but... But where is this infrastructure going to go? So this is a map where all the black is actually showing you areas where infrastructure already exists, roads already exist, rail lines already exist. So what are the places that are left? The places that are left are really the pristine forests, pristine biodiverse zone, and ecosystems that serve us really. And... Um, it's also important to sort of think, how will this infrastructure be built? You know, we are living in a world where there's a Paris Agreement, which is the climate agreement that really calls for countries to not only save what they have in terms of ensuring that adaptation can happen, climate adaptation can happen through it, but also look for mitigation commitments. For example, look for the materials that you're using in making your roads and railways. Water scarcity is driving conflict across countries, across regional, federal boundaries. And of course, we need more land for agriculture in cities. So when in the year 2023, we sit with a figure that says that we need at least, um, we need to see 75% of infrastructure, which we will see in 2050 does not exist today. It's in a very, very different paradigm as opposed to what it was when say, uh, some of us were born in the 80s, where you know, there was there was not so much competition for resources like land and water and, and material. It's also important to understand that a road is just not a road that is built. For example, um, linear infrastructure is usually referring to roads, railways, canals and pipelines. And a road is not just something that cuts a forest, but it really destroys a forest. So if you see 
um this is this is normally called the fishbone effect right so if you see in 2000 you can see the amazon green and clear then you see in 2004 the effect of some roads and then as the years progress one road comes and that opens up opportunity markets will come hospitals will come schools will come so a road really when it when it's planned it's planned in a way that it creates opportunities for more and more deforestation um uh, we also need to understand that the that the infrastructure that we are building today has to remain resilient not tomorrow for for generations to come so when we build a hydropower dam we don't have to look at climate projections for the next 10 years we have to look at climate projections at least for the next 50 years so that's the resilience our in infrastructure has to show and like parutta mentioned very clearly that we are not against infrastructure today you and i are connected across the world watching this webinar because of infrastructure um today you and i are able to have this conversation because we went to schools and we went to schools because there was a road to go to school right and um for basic things like access to sanitation healthcare facilities drinking water it's all infrastructure driven so there's no way we can say that we don't want infrastructure um currently when infrastructure projects are being planned we realize that more than 80% of infrastructure projects are delayed right and we also understand that a lot of these delays are quite avoidable so to say um 50% of these infrastructure projects are over budgeted 20% of these get cancelled and only really 20% are unaffected completely by social and environmental conflict right so out of the right side of of where i of out of my right side of this slide the 50% that is over budgeted 20% of course lands up getting cancelled and the 30 that remains really this is all of this is a phenomena where we are not incorporating truly the social environmental parameters that make infrastructure sustainable durable and workable for communities so very often what happens is that the way we are planning is that we are not taking into account the viability of the project is the project really needed which part of the community needs the project who is who is going to be the real beneficiary of the project and when the project will get rolled out how will we ensure that communities and environment does not get very badly negatively impacted so definitely we need to rethink planning there is no doubt about it so if we don't rethink planning today we are going to land up in a situation where we will probably build infrastructure and that will aggravate climate climate disasters so what happens currently this is the current developmental process currently this <laughs> this brain icon you know only when so normally infrastructure projects are how are they how are they planned there's a goal that the goal is probably to achieve um connectivity across an entire state and then somebody comes up with a concept and there's a design and then people look for funding and then where there's approvals right like when you need to get an environmental approval when you need to get some sort of approvals that's when the mind really starts working in terms of oh we probably need to do an assessment let's do a social impact assessment let's do an environmental impact assessment and at that stage the investment of time and resources really needed to ensure that the infrastructure project is truly sustainable and nature friendly is very high and the opportunity for innovation at an approval stage is very low because we've already designed we already know what we want so it almost becomes like retrofitting i'll come to this a little bit more because i do understand this is a little complicated and tricky but in essence what we're trying to say is that we need to move from this approval based thinking to pre planning thinking so a lot of the incorporation of principles of social safeguards environmental safeguards climate resilience durability of infrastructure really has to come even before we are defining the goal because the goal has to change the goal cannot really be about making a road winning votes and ensuring that i win the next election as a politician the goal has to be about ensuring that 
from the start, when I start planning for my country, for my state, for my city, I'm going to ensure that climate resilience, that environmental sustainability, that sustainable development goals are all incorporated. Now, one of the ways of doing that is understanding that nature has its own infrastructure that for millennia has remained and has given us a range of services. You know, there are forests that are filtering our air, there are rivers that are providing us with clean drinking water, mangroves that are providing us, protecting us during storms and various other provisional services that the nature is providing. Now, for example, can you see this picture where there are lush green mountains and there is, of course, there is, there is also a sea, but right between where the mountains are ending and the sea starting, there is a rail track, right? Now, I want to give you an example of how natural capital, natural capital is really the services we derive from nature, how natural capital matters for where you plan infrastructure. So we'll start from your left hand side. So upstream forests right affect flooding and erosion at the bridge so if if there is deforestation happening upstream there's going to be flooding on your railway line upslope vegetation will protect the road from landslides so if road or railway whatever track there is you know if there is going to be vegetation vegetation intact then the chances of road closures due to landslides or your rail track not working are going to be much lower and and similarly, there's a range of services that the ecosystem provides if the ecosystem is intact and conserved to ensure that the rail infrastructure, the road infrastructure, the hydropower infrastructure is able to work efficiently for people. Now, currently, infrastructure planning really offers the single most significant opportunity to integrate climate goals, sustainable development goals, and integrate social well-being goals. There's a study by UNOPS that says that if you get your infrastructure planning right, you can achieve more than 65% of your SDGs. And why do I say that? Because really strategic planning can incorporate, so on the top, we've written NDC, which is Nationally Determined Contributions to Climate, can incorporate strategic environmental assessment, can incorporate FPIC, which is pre-prior informed consent, ESGs, which is environmental, social, and governance due diligence and sustainability reporting. So across the, the, the middle line, the middle arrow, which is showing all these points upstream and downstream, at all these levels, we can integrate multi-hazard risk assessments. We can integrate various levels of tools to ensure that when we build infrastructure, it really works for the people. So now all of this seems really complicated to achieve, right? Lots of acronyms, lots of terminologies, and it's not for us to today educate you on all of this. But just to say that the opportunity truly exists, because if we don't do this, and if we keep relying on EIAs, then this is what happens. I want you all to focus on the uh, on the bottom photo uh, where there is a road going through a forest. Then you have these four options, you know. You would be like, okay, let's just cut across the forest, not think of anything. Okay, let's go around the forest, which is actually the best option. Or you'll think, okay, let's duck to cut across the forest, but we'll build a flyover or a flyway and all these things for the elephants to cross, you know, for some species to cross. Or, the, or really badly, in the option, you will think, let's just cut across, we'll plant some trees otherwise, otherwise, right? So if we want to avoid this scenario and really stick to something like the option, right, we need to understand we can't rely on... Um, EIAs, right? We have to understand that if we rely on EIAs, then there is a mitigation hierarchy and you will have to follow these steps. And very rarely will we have an option like B coming through. And very quickly, I'm coming to the end of my presentation now, but uh, in support with the Asian Research Institute for Environmental Law and some absolutely incredible and brilliant thinking we've developed a report called as the mapping pathways the, the link of which will be put in the chat as i speak 
which actually calls for this holistic model that at each stage of planning, design, approval, and construction, how can we ensure inclusivity and resilience in linear infrastructure planning? And there's an entire model there, none of which I'm going to go through, but I really urge you all to uh, flip through the pages of this report, to spread this report to practitioners, to, to academia, to people who are interested in infrastructure planning and also people who should be interested in infrastructure planning. For example, the, the elected member of your constituency who should know that when he or she or they approve a, a road, there is so much opportunity to get it right and there are so many impacts if we go wrong. And with that, I'm going to thank you uh, for your time. And if you want to ski, scan the uh, scan the QR code to read the report, please go ahead. There's also going to be the link in the chat, which will have the video and the report of all of the above. Thanks so much. Thank you, Uwana. Um, then let's jump jump into Q and A section. Um, actually, I think most of the questions are answered by Dennis and. Ryan already, but there is one question I really want to bring out. Um, so it's the question from Aki asking about how do we balance the reporting that doesn't fuel public fear about you know the species like that. But I think this question also applies to infrastructure projects too because we have a lot of reports across the media and many kind of anti development, you know, anti infrastructure. So my question would be, how do we frame this, you know, when we talk about infrastructure development? Um, Dennis or Uwana, do you want to answer this question? Parita, I lost, I lost the, uh, is the question written somewhere? Can I quickly read it? Is it oh, written yes. somewhere? So actually, it's answered by Ryan. Um, it didn't answer um, menu. So um, okay. that's one question about how do how how can we balance the reporting that that's okay. Okay, okay, the reporting. Yes. I am unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm not the right person for this. I'm probably going to pass it on to Ryan or Dennis in terms of reporting. I don't have an experience in hmm. environmental report. You want me to take a stab at it? So the question is about how do you avoid pointing the finger at bats mm. or other animals? Is that is that the the okay? So uh, you know we and, and I and I mentioned this in the chat. Uh, you know we went we tried to go to great lengths in our reporting to make the point that this isn't bats. And in fact, you know there are examples of uh, you know where bats have sort of been. Uh, dealt with, for lack of a better word, killed or or harassed or whatever by locals and other situations. And, and in fact, I think um, after the uh, origin of, of Ebola, uh, the 13 year old boy who started the West Africa, or, well, he didn't start it, but where he was um, infected and, and turned into the West Africa Ebola uh, outbreak. Um, you know, I believe locals, you know, the, the, the story I think was that he was playing in a tree uh, that was known to be inhabited by bats. And I think locals went and and either set the tree on fire or or smoked it out. I, I can't remember the specific events, sorry. Um, but we wanted to be very careful about, you know, demonizing these bats. It's us humans who are going into their world, right? Like, um, and so we tried to take very great care if you really you know there's a really great animation that our graphics department built that intros the story and throughout the text like i think we even it's been a while since we published but um i think we even have a sentence in there about you know this isn't about you know like you know vampire mo hollywood movies where the you know the bad is is the the evil doer you know this is this is about human activity. It's about our road, roads, our bridges, our um, you know, our urban expansion, our you know, endless thirst for livestock and and um, uh, uh, agricultural expansion that is eating into their their world and their habitat and putting them in closer proximity with us. Um, how's that? I hope I didn't ramble too much there. Yeah. And that's also a question from Joy Deep about um, what's 
I'm not sure whether I get it right. What's the applicability of this beyond Southeast Asia? I think he means the um the WWF infrastructure uh, approach. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely. Um so thanks, Joy Deep. I would quick, I mean, happy to chat with you separately on this because of paucity of time. But look, a lot of these principles and a lot of the legally binding uh commitments that countries make and the non-legally binding commitments also spread across uh, the world, right? So our commitments to nationally determined contributions, our, our commitments to uh, climate goals, CBD goals, are, are spreading across the world. And our need for incorporating inclusivity and resilience in climate planning, in infrastructure planning, definitely resonates from across the world. So I would say that, yes, we focused on the ASEAN because of the context that the ASEAN countries are in currently, high infrastructure demand, high interest, need for connectivity. But definitely the principles remain the, sp remain the same. Wherever indigenous people live, wherever climate threats are high, any vulnerable populations are, need are going to need these principles to ensure that infrastructure works for them. I hope that answers. Okay. I think we are running out of time. But finally, Dennis, I think there's one question that want you to address about uh, the deforestation in Laos. And Cambodia, you wanna like answer this um live? I, I just actually I answered already this question in uh, in the chat, but um, I at least partially answered. But actually, it's quite complicated the issues. There are few countries uh, in in the region with different level of forest degradation and deforestation. So the Cambodia, for instance, in uh, well known uh, for the highest deforestation level in in the world. <laughs> So the, the Laos looks like in a better situation. It has less dense population, but and more forest resources. But it's very fragile. So this is this forest. Vietnam and Thailand so already banned logging. It's same as in China. They are banned logging in the natural forest. So it's really a uh, complicated balance between the need, needs of the markets, including the needs of traditional markets, for, for instance, for making traditional furniture, which, which is not really the uh, most urgent thing in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the consumption, uh, consumption world. But, but anyway, uh, changing governments in Laos, even it's one party system, it's very much depends on, on the current governments in, in, in Laos. For, for instance, the previous government was really aware of, um, of the illegal logging issues uh, and uh, they enforced the ban on, on, on exports of, of wood from, from Laos. So other governments, I don't know how far they're interested in, in this issue. So actually, I believe that, so it's my personal opinion that one of the main driving force of illegal logging in, in the region, same as the deforestation, is a corruption and uh, level of public oversight, uh, civil society oversight uh, of, uh, of logging activities and natural use uh, in, in, in the countries. So for instance, in Thailand is a country with, with a very well developed tradition of, of democracy, for, for instance, there is more uh, close oversights of the logging and all activities related to, to the forest pr protection. In Laos, in Cambodia, situation is uh, more difficult. Thank you. Um, we are a bit over time. Um, are you okay if I need to close this webinar? Um, and, and, and just to announce that um, we, my team gonna pass the presentation and also the contact of um, the three speakers to you. I think it's gonna be ready a few days after this webinar. So if you want to have like continue the conversation with them, you can contact them directly after. Um, and also after this webinar, we are gonna send you the online survey. Um, it will take you no more than five minutes. Um, I promise. And yeah, we just need some feedback to improve the next webinar throughout this year. So I guess that's all. Um, thank you, um, Ryan, Dennis, and Uana for today um, for giving us a lot of input. I hope that um, we, even I, or even the audience can follow up with you after on the specific topic that you discussed. 
So um, thank you again and see you in the next webinar. So thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye you. bye. Bye bye.